So today we are going to talk about chapter 14, which covers the blood, but I've divided it up into two parts. So in the first part, we're basically going to talk about the cells, and then in the second part, we're going to talk about blood typing and disorders. So first of all, blood is a type of connective tissue. It is the only liquid connective tissue, but it serves a very important function because it transports everything in our body. It also helps distribute heat. When our body needs to warm up, our blood vessels can either dilate or constrict to get blood where it needs to go. It also maintains stability of interstitial fluid and the amount of blood actually varies by our body size. It can also change its fluid concentration and electrolyte concentration and it's gonna vary with the amount of adipose tissue that we have. Blood is about 8% of our body weight. In males, it's about 5 to 6 liters, and females, about 4 to 5 liters. Blood cells are formed mostly in the red bone marrow, and these are called the formed elements. There are red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. This is just showing you blood that has been centrifuged. As you can see, it separates out into layers. There's the plasma layer the red blood cell layer, and then that buffy coat in the middle are the white blood cells and platelets. So in a centrifuge blood sample, about 55% of it is plasma, 45% are red blood cells, and then the rest are white blood cells and platelets. So as you can see, we mo mostly have red blood cells in our blood as opposed to white blood cells. There's only a few white blood cells but white blood cells are very important in immunity, which is covered in chapter 16. The percentage of red blood cells is called the hematocrit, and that's not in red just because it, we're talking about red blood cells. It's in red because it's important. It may also be referred to as the pack cell volume, but make sure you know what the hematocrit is. This is just showing you the breakdown of a drop of blood. You have 55% plasma, 45% formed elements, and then how that breaks down. So the formed elements, you have about 4.8% of that as platelets. Only about 0.1% is white blood cells. But again, even though there's only a few of them, they are very important, functionally speaking. And then 95% of the formed elements are red blood cells. In the plasma, you have electrolytes. It's mainly water, about 92%. There's about 7% protein, some waste, nutrients, vitamins, hormones, gases, of course, carbon dioxide and oxygen, and also nitrogen. The proteins, you have albumins, globulins, and fibrinogen, and we'll talk about some of those later. And then the white blood cells, you have neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, monocytes, and lymphocytes, and we'll talk about each one of those as well. Universally speaking, there is a set of specific safety measures that has to be taken by healthcare workers because there are a lot of bloodborne infectious pathogens out there and we need to prevent the transmission of them. This is mainly going to be used for HIV, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C viruses, but it also applies to others as well. Universal means that it's going to be assumed that any patient may have been exposed to bloodborne pathogens, so we're going to take these precautions no matter who comes in. It's estimated about 4 to 7 percent of new cases of infectious disease are transmitted because of unsafe injections, so these protocols are really important to follow. Specific recommendations to prevent infection, of course, using personal protective equipment, so wear your gloves, wear your masks, Use fume hoods and have sharps containers so that when you're done with the needle, you can put it into the sharps container. And of course, things is hand washing. Now this is showing you a hematopoietic stem cell. It's going to differentiate into one of two cells, a myeloid stem cell or a lymphoid stem cell. The lymphoid stem cells are going to differentiate into our lymphocytes and the myeloid stem cells are going to differentiate into everything else. And we're going to talk about all of this. Formation of the blood cells is known as hematopoiesis, and they're going to originate in the red marrow from either hematopoietic stem cells or hemocytoblasts. The stem cells give rise to more stem cells and give rise to more specialized and differentiated cells in response to specific growth factors. 
So as I said, we have myeloid stem cells and lymphoid stem cells. Lymphoid stem cells will give rise to the lymphocytes and the myeloid stem cells give rise to everything else. Red blood cells are also called erythrocytes. The picture shows you they are biconcave discs. They remind me of the generic lifesavers that don't have the hole in the middle because they're generic. Anyway, one third is hemoglobin. We have oxyhemoglobin, meaning it has oxygen, or deoxyhemoglobin, meaning it does not have oxygen. They do not have nuclei and mitochondria. The reason is that they eject their nucleus so that there's more room to carry oxygen, because that is the main point of red blood cells, to carry oxygen to the rest of our bodies. They can't divide, so they only have about a 120-day lifespan, but they can produce ATP through glycolysis. The red blood cell count is the number of red blood cells in a cubic millimeter or a microliter of blood. Typically, males are somewhere in the range of 4.7 million to 6.1 million, females 4.2 million to 5.4 million, and children 4.5 million to 5.1 million. Red blood cell counts are gonna be useful in diagnosing diseases and evaluating the progress of certain diseases. Again, changes in red blood cell counts are gonna reflect changes in the blood's oxygen carrying capacity because that's what red blood cells do. They carry oxygen to the rest of the body. Erythropoiesis is red blood cell formation. This happens in the red bone marrow. Low blood oxygen is going to cause the kidneys and the liver to release erythropoietin, which is that hormone we talked about in chapter 13, and that's going to stimulate red blood cell production. It's a negative feedback mechanism. So a hemocytoplast is going to differentiate into erythroblasts, which will differentiate into reticulocytes, and then finally mature into erythrocytes. Within a few days, you're going to have a lot of red blood cells appear in the blood. We also briefly talked about blood doping before and how some athletes might take some of their, red, their blood out because that's taking red blood cells out and our body's going to do this and replace them. And then right before the race, they will re-inject their blood so that they have all of that extra oxygen carrying capacity. However, it's dangerous because you got to remember that you're also adding to the blood volume. Vitamin B12 and folic acid are required for DNA synthesis and necessary for the growth and division of all cells. Iron is required for hemoglobin synthesis. And hemoglobin is the molecule that is going to, or the protein, I should say, that is going to carry the actual oxygen. So hemoglobin is extremely important for survival. And that chart just shows you the substance, the source, and the function. Anemia occurs if you have an oxygen-carrying capacity that is low. You do not have enough red blood cells or you do not have enough hemoglobin. There's a bunch of different types of anemia, as you can see. Sickle cell is one we talk about a lot. Sickle cell is when you have an abnormal hemoglobin strain. So it causes the red blood cells to form a sickle instead of the nice biconcave disc, so they can't carry oxygen as well. There's also aplastic anemia, hemolytic anemia, iron deficiency anemia. Iron deficiency anemia is common. It's due to a lack of iron in our diet. And sometimes pregnant women, like me, if I'm pregnant, I'm always deficient in iron. So I used to have to take iron pills. And that happens quite a bit. Thalassemia is an actual defective gene. So you have red blood cells that do not live very long because they're hemoglobin deficient. Red blood cells, like I said, only have about a 120 day lifespan. So they are destroyed and a lot of them are going to be recycled. So this shows you the major events. So first you got that squeezing through the capillaries of active tissues actually damages them. They have a protein called spectrum, and that protein is what helps them be flexible and get through those tiny capillaries, but they can only take so much before they get damaged. Macrophages in the spleen and the liver are then gonna phagocytize those damaged red blood cells. The hemoglobin is gonna be decomposed into hemoglobin. The heme is then gonna be further decomposed into iron and biliverdin. Iron is then gonna be made available for reuse 
to make new hemoglobin, or it's going to be stored in the liver as ferritin. Biliverdin is sometimes converted into bilirubin. And then biliverdin and bilirubin are secreted in the bile as bile pigments. The globin is finally broken down into the amino acids and metabolized by macrophages or released into the plasma. So then we can even use those amino acids again. This is showing you the life cycle of a red blood cell. So the small intestine is where 90% of our nutrient absorption occurs. And of course, blood is what's going to transport these absorbed nutrients. The red blood cells are produced in the bone marrow and then circulate for, as I said, about 120 days. The macrophages then phagocytize and break them down so that we can reuse the components that we just discussed. This shows you the structural breakdown. White blood cells, also called leukocytes, these protect against disease. So again, function in immunity. They have limited lifespan, so they have to constantly be replaced, and there just aren't a lot of them in the blood anyway. They're produced in the red bone marrow under the control of interleukins and colony stimulating factors. We have five types and two categories. The two categories are granulocytes and agranulocytes. Granulocytes, as the name implies, means they have grains. So when they stain, you can see that grainy appearance. Agranulocytes do not. So the three granulocytes are neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. The two agranulocytes are lymphocytes and monocytes. So neutrophils are small light purple granules when they are stained with an acid-based stain. It has a lobe nucleus that will have anywhere from two to five sections. They're also called PMNs or polymorphonuclear leukocytes. They're the first responders, so they get to the infection site first. They are really strong phagocytes, and the majority of the leukocytes that we have circulating are neutrophils. If we have a bacterial infection, these are going to be elevated. So neutrophils are going to get to the infection site, and then they're going to determine what needs to happen and call others to the site as necessary by releasing chemicals. Eosinophils have coarse granules that stain a very deep red. There's a bilobe nucleus. They moderate allergic reactions and defend against parasitic worm infestations. Only 1 to 3% of the leukocytes are eosinophils. Again, if you have a parasitic worm infection or an allergic reaction, these are going to be elevated. Less than 1% of leukocytes are basophils. They have large granules that stain a very deep blue and can sometimes hide the nucleus. They release histamine to stimulate inflammation and release heparin to stop blood clots from forming. They're similar to the size and shape of eosinophils, but again, you can tell the difference because they have those dark, deep blue granules. Monocytes are the largest of the white blood cells. They have spherical, kidney-shaped, or oval nuclei. They are agranulocytes, so you're not going to see any grains. They leave the bloodstream to become macrophages, and that's really important. Once they leave the bloodstream, the macrophages are then going to phagocytize bacteria, dead cells, and debris. So they're the cleanup crew. About 3 to 9% of the leukocytes are monocytes, and they live for weeks or even months sometimes. The last type are lymphocytes. These are slightly larger than red blood cells. These are actually the smallest of the white blood cells. They have a large spherical nucleus, which takes up most of the cell. It's surrounded by a very thin rim of cytoplasm. T cells and B cells are the major types, and they're both important in immunity. They directly attack pathogens, T cells do, and tumor cells. B cells are the ones that produce antibodies. 25 to 33% of the leukocytes are lymphocytes, and these can live for years. And we talk more about T cells and B cells in the chapter on immunity. So for now, T cells attack pathogens and tumor cells directly. B cells produce antibodies, so they don't directly attack cells. If you need to remember the order of number of white blood cells, remember never let monkeys eat bananas. So never neutrophils, let lymphocytes, monkeys, monocytes, eat eosinophils, bananas, basophils. 
That is the order in number from the most numerous to the least numerous. Diapodesis is how white blood cells actually squeeze between the cells of the capillary wall to leave the blood vessel. That's how they get to the infection site. CAM molecules are going to direct the leukocytes to the injury site. Phagocytosis is how they engulf and digest the pathogens. Again, neutrophils and monocytes are the most mobile and active phagocytes. The inflammatory response is the reaction that's going to keep the infection in that particular area. It's going to involve swelling and increased capillary permeability so that the infection doesn't spread. It's going to be promoted by basophils and by the secretion of heparin and histamine. And then positive chemotaxis is how white blood cells are attracted to an infection site by the chemicals that are released by the damaged cells. So again, the chemicals are going to be released and the white blood cells will come. Neutrophils respond to the bacterial invasion by accumulating in the infection site, and then they're going to destroy the pathogens by phagocytosis. So for example, if you splinter, if you step on a splinter, or you are doing something and you get a splinter in your finger, the bacteria are going to be introduced into the dermis, then they're going to multiply. That's going to cause the injured cells to release histamine, which is going to cause the blood vessels to dilate and become leaky. The neutrophils will then move through the blood vessel walls to migrate towards those bacteria through diapodesis and then destroy them by phagocytosis. Some white blood cell counts, a white blood cell count is going to be used to count the number of white blood cells. Usually it's 3,500 to 10,500. A high white blood cell count, so greater than 10,500, is called leukocytosis. This usually indicates you have an acute infection or you are doing vigorous exercise. You have a great loss of body fluids. A low white blood cell count, so lower than 3,500, is leukopenia. This could be indicative of typhoid fever, flu, measles, mumps, chickenpox, AIDS, polio, anemia, a lot of viral infections. And the differential WBC count is a list of the percentages of each type of leukocyte that you have. The percentages may change in particular diseases. And as we said, neutrophil number increases during bacterial infections. Helper T cells, which are a type of lymphocyte, decrease in HIV infections. So HIV infects helper T cells and helper T cells mediate the immune response. So without helper T cells, we don't have an immune response. So those that have the HIV infection, that's what becomes the problem. They don't have helper T cells because the virus takes them out, so they don't have an immune response. So AIDS doesn't kill them, HIV doesn't kill them. It's an opportunistic infection that will kill them. But a differential white blood cell count is something that they will typically run to figure out how many leukocytes you have and what percentages might be off so that they can go from there and figure out what's going on. This is just showing you if you have elevated lymphocytes, you could have a leukemia, whooping cough, eosinophils, tapeworm infestations, hookworm, or just an allergic reaction, elevated monocytes, typhoid fever, malaria. Neutrophils are usually bacterial, and if you don't have enough helper T cells or lymphocytes, AIDS. Leukemia is a cancer of the white blood cells. It's classified as acute when the symptoms appear suddenly and progress rapidly. Chronic is if it begins slowly, so it goes undetected for months or even years. Lymphoid leukemia is cancer of the lymphocytes, which are produced in the lymph nodes. Myeloid leukemia or cancer of the granulocytes produced in the red bone marrow. Some symptoms, you have an excess number of white blood cells, you're tired, headache, nosebleeds, a lot of respiratory infections, you might have some bone pain, you have bruising and bleeding more often because it takes longer for your blood to clot. Treatments include traditional treatments like chemotherapy, drugs that target enzymes specific to cancer cells, bone marrow or stem cell transplants, and trying to refine the diagnosis to get more specific so that we can target a treatment. 
Finally, platelets are the thrombocytes. These are actually fragments as opposed to cells. The megakaryocyte, which is type of stem cell, is going to fragment, the membrane's gonna fragment, and those are the thrombocytes. They're produced by hemocytoblasts in response to thrombopoietin, which is a hormone. So a hemocytoblast is going to differentiate into a megakaryocyte, which will then fragment into thrombocytes. They do not have a nucleus and are less than half the size of a red blood cell. Platelet count is about 150,000 to 350,000. These help in hemostasis, which is stoppage of bleeding in damaged blood vessels by sticking to the broken surfaces. That's one of the positive feedback mechanisms we have in our body. The platelets will release chemicals to get more platelets to the area until a platelet plug is formed. They release serotonin, which causes the smooth muscles in the walls of the broken blood vessels to contract. So here is a chart showing you all of the components of blood that we just talked about, their numbers and their functions. So that is all for the first part. Part two, again, we're going to talk about some of the disorders and blood typing. I will see you later. Bye.